Herman Melville was born in New York on August 1, 1819. New York was then a small but thriving seaport of about 130,000 people, and most of it was centered around what we now know as Lower Manhattan Island and the park known as Battery Park. In streets such as these, the business of importing and exporting goods was carried on. New York was the busiest port in the nation, and living only a few yards from the sea and from the hundreds of ships moving out and in was perhaps the most important influence that was to bear on the young Herman Melville. Alan Melville, Herman's father, was up to this time a successful importer of luxury French goods, such as silks, gloves and clothes. He came from Boston, where his father, Major Thomas Melville, was a respected figure who claimed descent from a titled Scottish family. Alan Melville spoke good French, had travelled and was an educated and sophisticated man who had good reason to expect continued affluence for his young family. He had married Maria Gansevoort. She came from a rich and successful Dutch family based in Albany, the capital of New York State. She dressed fashionably and had been well educated. She turned out to be a sober and intelligent woman devoted to her children and family at large. Marriage to Maria could only have been an advantage to Alan Melville in his business and family life. Maria's father was General Peter Gansevoort, who had become famous in the American Revolution when he defended Fort Stanwix, a name Melville was to give to one of his own sons. General Peter was therefore a father-in-law to be proud of. As some measure of the family's importance, a New York street still bears the family name. In the New York of today, there is little evidence of the tremendous maritime activity of the 19th century. It's not hard to see, with the vast, safe anchorage presented by the mouth of the Hudson River and the long shoreline of Manhattan Island, how the port developed. Rotting piers are all that remain. For 150 years or more, ships tied up here and the goods that they passed helped to make the United States one of the world's great trading nations. On the East River shore, the city proudly preserves some of the ships which used to be such a lively part of the New York scene. Tar and barrels, ropes and rigging were everything around here, and for the young Melville it was to be a magical and ever entrancing scene. The city where the skyscrapers now dominate the mastheads of yesterday was, as it still is, a center of trade and commerce, totally open and subject to all the ups and downs that beset men in the life of trade. However, Almost from the day Herman was born, Providence stopped favoring the Melvilles and his family fortunes began to wane. No doubt Mrs. Melville continued for a time to walk on the battery along with everyone else who aspired to elegance. Social life in the city was growing in substance and style. The French businessmen who came with their goods to Alan Melville's office continued to dine at his house and the little boy Melville must have garnered some of the international flavour of the life in which his father moved so easily. Travel to distant places was commonplace in the talk of the Melville household. The harbour was full of ships. Still, in 1819, almost all of them were sailing ships, 
though in 1814 the first steam frigate, the Fulton, had been launched and before long steam river boats were being developed for journeys up the Hudson to Albany, for example. This one was called the Claremont. The development of these boats allowed the better off to journey upriver to healthier climes, especially in the summer when New York heat and grime was unbearable. Soon after Herman was born, his mother feared an outbreak of fever which was sweeping the city and set off upriver to the safety of her parents' home in Albany. It was the beginning of many such dashes to safety in Albany, for back in New York, business was seriously affected by the diseases hitting the city. Most of Alan Melville's well-off customers having fled, like his wife. After several years of struggle in New York and much financial help from his wife's family, as well as his own, when Herman was 12 years old, his father was finally forced into bankruptcy and the family moved into a rented house in Market Street in Albany. It was a crushing blow to Alan Melville, reduced to being a clerk in a first door. There was one benefit. Albany Academy was the best school in town, and Uncle Peter Gansevoort was a trustee. So Herman and his elder brother, who had been given the name Gansevoort as his first name, were enrolled. The academy was enlightened in that it did not teach classical studies exclusively, but included other subjects. Herman is recorded as having done well in mathematics and bookkeeping. Though he was not particularly keen on school, he seemed to have no difficulties there. By 1832, Alan Melville, his father, had died of pneumonia and Gansevoort, Herman's elder brother used money his mother had inherited to start in business. They lived in Clinton Square. Prosperity seemed theirs again, and Herman went to work in his Uncle Peter's bank. But within five years, Gansevoort was ruined by another national financial crisis. The family moved to Lansingborough, a small town upriver from Albany and situated on the East Bank. They lived in this house, and in it Gansevoort suffered a nervous collapse and was an invalid for a year. Herman tried teaching at a school near Pittsfield, where his uncle had his farm, but found no one wanted to learn, and the pay was too little. He returned to his mother in Lansingborough. At the nearby Lansingborough Academy, a private high school, he decided to study surveying and took a course with a view to getting work on the Erie Ship Canal, then being built. While he was in Lansingborough, he had his first writing published in the local newspaper. Nothing came of the Erie Canal job, and in May 1839 he decided to leave Lansingborough and its secure environment on the banks of the River Hudson and return to New York with a view to taking a job on a ship so that he could see the world. Gansevoort had recovered and had already moved to town. He helped Herman get a place on a ship going to England. On June 3, 1839, when he was almost 20, Herman Melville signed on as a boy on the packet ship St. Lawrence. On the 5th, the ship sailed, and Herman began to learn the ways of the sea. The experience must have been quite startling to Melville, moving from the genteel ways of his mother and sisters in Lansingborough to the roughness and ignorance of the sailors with whom he now worked. Some years later, he was to turn the story of this first voyage into a book, Redburn, where the hero is the son of a wealthy family who takes to the sea to improve his health. As Melville came to like the seafaring life so much, it is reasonable to suppose that he quickly became adept at his duties. In a sailing ship, there was certainly plenty to keep the crew occupied with all the complications of ropes and sails, 
not to mention matters like navigation and the weather. Liverpool he found a terrible experience. He visited a number of places his father had told him of, but his strongest feelings were about the dirt and degradation and the huge numbers of beggars. Mostly people turned off the land and looking for work in the big cities, something that had not yet happened in New York. The return voyage took longer than the outward trip, and he was finally back in New York on October 1st. He went straight home to the house at Lansingborough. He was welcomed by his family, but his mother's financial plight had worsened. He tried various teaching jobs and even went to work with an uncle in Illinois. But by the autumn of 1840, he was back again looking for work. New Bedford, on the coast of Massachusetts, was the center of whaling in the United States. Whaling was a large and growing industry because the oil produced by boiling down the blubber of the animal was prized as an oil for lamps. And although collecting the oil was a lengthy and hazardous business, huge fortunes were to be made from it. All business in New Bedford centered around whaling, so there went Melville his mind made up to sign on for a whaling voyage. This was no small step. The specially constructed whaling ships often made voyages of four years or more, so such a decision was a huge commitment in a person's life. Today the harbour at New Bedford is crowded with fishing boats, which keep it functioning and alive. The old part of the town roundabout is well preserved and the whaling history well documented. Melville's masterpiece Moby Dick was written around part of the experiences on this voyage and the opening chapters of the book very clearly reflect the feelings he must have had when he signed on as an ordinary seaman on the whaling ship a Cushnet on December 26th. His name appears on the crew list of the ship, dated December 31st, 1840. It is likely that, like Ishmael in the book, he attended the Seaman's Bethel, or chapel, on the Sunday of that weekend. Like most New England buildings, it is a wood-framed structure. The spire has been added since his day. It has a remarkable interior. Remarkable, firstly, is the pulpit, in the shape of a ship's prow, from whence the weekly sermon was delivered to the sailors about to leave their loved ones for such a long voyage. The building is remarkable, too, because after a visit here, you are in no doubt that the job you are about to undertake is a dangerous one. On the walls are rows of tablets, rimmed in black, commemorating some of the men who have been lost at sea, swept overboard, fallen overboard, crushed, or otherwise lost while pursuing whales all across the world. It is hard to escape whaling in New Bedford. The grand old custom house indicates by its splendor and size the amount of business that was done here. There is a statue to a man who developed a new and effective harpoon the weapon by which the whales were killed. And there is another of a harpoonist himself, the leader of the little whaling boats which were lowered from the mothership to row after their quarry so that the harpoonist could get close enough to strike. Most of all for Melville, of course, would be the presence of the dozens of sailors in the bars at night, telling their tales of whales caught and whales that got away and even of the great white whale Moby Dick, who terrorized the whalers by turning to strike at the boats that pursued him. The opening to the book he was to write ten years later is a remarkable recollection of these first few hours in New Bedford. The Akushnet was a new ship weighing 358 tons. It had all the latest equipment and the barrels to bring back the oil. 
She was named after the river which flows by New Bedford to the sea, and she sailed, in fact, from Fairhaven across the bay from New Bedford on Sunday, January 3rd, 1841. The voyage on which Herman Melville had embarked was to be quite the most momentous act of his life. In his book, Melville gives wonderful descriptions of the operations of a whaling crew at work. The ships were not very large, so contending with the weather, such as they must have met when they set off in the dead of winter from New Bedford, must have been hard enough. One duty from the word go was to take a turn as lookout for whales at the top of one of the three masts. The American whalers did not have crow's nests. The lookout just stood there and hung on. When he saw a whale spouting, he gave the cry, there she blows, and the whole ship rushed into action. There were usually three crews of six oarsmen, with one of them acting as the harpoonist at the right moment. The ropes attached to the harpoons were carefully coiled, so they would run out easily when the whale dived after being struck. Everything was carefully worked out, and everyone was prepared, but given the monstrous creatures they were chasing and the vagaries of sea and weather, it was a highly dangerous operation. The boats would try to get as close to the whales as possible without being noticed, otherwise they might have to row very hard to keep up with a fast-swimming whale. At just the right moment, the harpoonist threw his harpoon and hoped it would lodge, or the second one, which he threw immediately afterwards. The rope would at once become alive and pour out of the boat so fast that anyone touching it would be burned or dragged overboard. Of course, people got knocked into the water or the whale's tail would lash out and shatter the boat. People got cut by the flying lances which missed the whale. Sometimes the whale would come up under the boat and overturn it or even crush it in its vast jaws. The experience must have been a nightmare the first time and a terror thereafter. Artists made many efforts to show the horrors of whaling, but Melville finds them all inadequate in their depiction. He himself wonderfully conveys this terror and also the incredible sense of elation the men felt when the chase was over. With all sorts of elaborate tackle, the blubber had to be stripped off the body before the sharks could eat it all. The mates who were in charge of the operation were full of pride in their skills and the crews full of respect for them. When the blubber was aboard, it had to be heated to get the oil out. It was a long and exhausting task. It is not surprising that as each killing was such a terrifying adventure, there was much recounting of tales of this or that whale, and that such a legend as that of the white whale should grow up. The mythology of the sea notwithstanding, on board ship, Christian religious practices were strictly maintained, helping to preserve a sense of order in the little community, so long cut off from society. The Akushnet was making for the whaling grounds of the South Pacific, and getting there meant sailing round Cape Horn and stopping at the Galapagos Islands, home of the Great Turtles. Whaling ships often stopped here to replenish their larders. The Akushnet cruised the waters thereabouts for several months, and gradually it seems Melville's taste for the ship and its crew began to wear thin so that by the time they were on their way south to the Marquesa Islands, he had had quite enough and had resolved, along with a friend, to jump ship. They sighted the mountains on the islands on June 23, 1842, after he'd been at sea for about 18 months, and as they sailed along the coast the next morning, they caught glimpses of blooming valleys, waterfalls, beaches, rocky headlands, every moment opening to the view some new and startling scene of beauty. What they did not expect to see were the warships of France, 
which was in the process then of annexing islands in the South Pacific. Melville had grown up with grandfathers who had fought for their freedom against colonial power, so this activity was not to his taste. Nor did he find the work of the missionaries any better. As he got to know the islands and the islanders, he found the work of Christian missionaries from Europe or the States quite inappropriate to the people of Polynesia, who had already a perfectly satisfactory code of life, as he saw it. Meanwhile, however, his ship was boarded by the young girls of the islands, pictured here some 80 years later, who seemed quite happy to indulge the sailors who had been deprived of female company for so long. This indulgence seemed to last throughout the whole of their stay, and Melville makes much of it in his novel Typey, set around his adventures in the Marquesas. These same gentle-looking islanders also enjoyed a considerable reputation as cannibals who, given the right circumstances, would look with a tasty eye on any young white man who happened to go astray. This did not seem to deter Melville, however, from his plan to escape the tyranny of his captain, the terrible food, and the neglect of anyone who fell sick. As he recounts in Taipei, he and his companion, Toby, prepared themselves carefully for their escape, hid some food in their clothing, and waited until their compatriots were asleep in a beach hut on shore before stealing away into the trees. They meant to stay with a tribe called the Hapa, who had a reputation for peacefulness. Instead, they strayed into the Taipei Valley, where they expected to be eaten at any moment. In Taipei, the hero is injured and his friend escapes to get help. After some months with these people, he too escapes, but not before he has come to admire many aspects of their almost idyllic lives, and certainly finding no evidence that they wanted to eat him. Indeed, he experienced the utmost kindness. Taipei is fiction, but it is certainly based on the facts of Melville's real-life visit. Melville eventually signed on to other ships, including an American Navy ship, the United States, which he boarded in Honolulu. Life on board this ship was quite different from a whaler, and he was appalled by the cruelty of the punishments for misdemeanors. The whippings and the misery of the victims he was to remember vividly when writing Billy Budd about 50 years later. Rules and punishments for breaking them seemed to take up everyone's time. The United States arrived in Boston Harbor on October 3rd, 1844, almost four years after Melville had left New Bedford. Back in Lansingborough, his tales so delighted his family that they encouraged him to write them down. He began work on Taipei, a peep at Polynesian life. And to his delight, after some months' delay, his brother Gansevoort, now back on his feet and a secretary at the U.S. legation in London, found an English publisher called John Murray to take it on and pay £100 for the right to print 1,000 copies. In February 1846, it came out in both London and New York, and most reviewers found it entertaining. Religious magazines in America, however, were scandalized at the views on missionary activities he expressed. Melville obligingly toned them down in a second edition of the book. Toby Green, who had escaped with him from the Akushnet, read the book and happily authenticated the story. So Herman's stock rose, and he began work on a second book about the South Seas, which he called Omu. It earned him over $2,000 in the first year, more even than Taipei had done. It was an exciting time in his life, and it gave him the confidence to marry and set up a home. His bride was Elizabeth Shaw, a girl he had known since childhood. She was the daughter of Lemuel Shaw, Chief Justice of Massachusetts, to whom he had dedicated his first book, Taipei. Mardi was published with difficulty in 1849, but its pessimism and even despair did not go down with the reviewers. 
It was already too far ahead of its time, and it would certainly not pay his bills. To that end he wrote Redburn, a straightforward tale based on his voyage to Liverpool, and with it he regained some of his disappearing audience. He followed this up with White Jacket, a vivid account of his life on board the United States. He decided to sail to England to bargain for the sale of the rights himself. In London he was lionized as a successful American author. He did a good deal on the rights for his books. He travelled on the continent, and he was invited to dine with all the right literary people. Back in New York, he was surrounded by babies and the many women in his family. The atmosphere was not conducive to work. But a chance visit to Pittsfield, the old home of his uncle, which he had known as a boy, led him to buy a house and farm where he moved with his family in September 1850. It was a home for all the family, with room for him to write in peace. All he needed was continued success. He called the house Arrowhead because of the Indian arrowheads he found there. He began Moby Dick. It had started as a tale based on his experiences, rather like his other books, but as he got into his fascinating research about whaling, he came across the legend of the white whale. It turned out to be Melville's finest and most enduring work. Nathaniel Hawthorne was a neighbour, and the two struck up a great friendship. It was an added attraction to life at Arrowhead, but as far as his work was concerned, Moby Dick was received with incomprehension and disappointment. He managed to sustain life at Arrowhead for a few years more by writing for magazines, and in 1856 he published a novel, The Confidence Man. It was again the dark allegory his countrymen were just not interested in, and it basically finished his literary career. He now had two sons and two daughters to support. Pleas for help went out from Arrowhead. Hawthorne had been made a US consul in Liverpool. Such a post would suit Melville very well. Nothing came of it, and they eventually had to sell Arrowhead. He was given a post as a customs officer in New York. It was back to the pier heads and the ships he had known as a boy. His work took him out in all weathers to inspect the cargoes in the holds. He got no promotion. His son Malcolm shot himself when he was 18. Stanwix died in California of tuberculosis. The elder daughter Bessie had chronic arthritis and never married, though Fanny was more fortunate. She married and went to live not far away in New Jersey. It is, however, a sad family chronicle. Melville wrote some poetry in his spare time over the next 19 years, and some of it was published in private editions. Relief, however, only came in the form of inheritances for himself and his wife, which enabled him to retire from the Customs Service in December 1885. One more work remained unfinished, Billy Budd. Mrs. Melville found the manuscript in his desk after his death on September 28, 1891. The New York Daily Telegraph wrote only one paragraph about him, saying that Typey was his best work. Billy Budd remained unpublished until 1924. Melville was unrecognised and forgotten in his own time. It was not until well into the 20th century that he was seen to be quite the equal of any other American writer of his time and quite unique in his blend of allegory and an almost 20th century psychological insight into the pressures and ambitions that beset man in his passage through life.
Melville wrote poetry, short stories, and novels, but it is for his novels that he is best known. There are ten novels in all, the last of which was published posthumously. The first two, Taipei, 1846, and Omu, 1847, grew out of his experiences as a crew member of ships in the South Pacific. They were very successful for their unusual subject matter, perhaps, but also because, from the start, Melville could write well, and he had a remarkable imagination. Mardi, 1849, Redburn, 1849, and White Jacket, 1850, again called on his sailing experiences, but gradually, as his ideas developed, he began to leave his readers behind. In Moby Dick, published in 1851, he produced his finest work, and the book has dazzled readers ever since. In the minds of most literate people, it is the greatest American novel of the 19th century. Sadly, Melville never scaled such heights again. There is much that is fine in Pierre, 1852, and Israel Potter, 1855, and then in The Confidence Man, 1857. But in his own preoccupations and his troubled family circumstances, he seemed to lose touch with his audience. Long after his death, the unfinished Billy Budd was published in 1924, and it is now recognised as vintage Melville. It has become particularly famous as the subject of Britain's most successful opera. Short Stories in 1856, a group of short stories under the name Piazza Tales was published, having appeared in Putnam's Monthly Magazine. They make good reading, but regretfully he wrote no more. Poems. Melville cared a lot about these works, but he had little success with them. Battle Pieces of 1866, poems about the Civil War, were well received by the more perceptive critics, but the next... Clarell, written ten years later in 1876, a philosophical poem of 600 lines about a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, mystified his readers. Two other minor collections followed, John, Ma, and other sailors in 1888, he was on old familiar ground here, and the last, Timoleon, a miscellaneous collection, was privately printed in 1891. The essence of Melville. The trajectory of Melville's creative life was sadly distorted, but in the early works there is much to enjoy. However, in Moby Dick he has left a work of undisputed genius, and it surely makes its mark on all who read it. <laughs>